Good morning. Um, today we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 24 and thinking a little bit about what we can learn from David in the waiting room. Is it a little bit echoey? Sounds echoey from me. Shall I move away from the other microphones? I'm okay? Okay, cool. So yeah, so we're going to be thinking about what we can learn from David in that kind of period of waiting. Um, But before we do, I just want a little bit of audience participation. It's not too scary, so don't worry. I just want a quick show of hands. How many of us actually like waiting? Okay. How many of us think it's fun? No. Worthwhile? Okay, a few think it's worthwhile. Good. Okay. An enjoyable experience? No. Okay, how many of us find waiting boring. Yeah, I definitely agree on that one. (laughs) Frustrating? Yeah, you might just want to keep your hands up actually. Inconvenient? Yeah, a waste of time? Some, yeah, it can depend, can't it? So yeah, I think we all have a similar attitude on what we feel about waiting. But it might be that some of us here are waiting for something right now. Maybe these feelings are really real for you. Maybe we're waiting for God to fulfill his promise to us, or we're simply waiting for him to show up. Perhaps we're getting tired of waiting. We're not sure it's really worth it anymore, and we're thinking of taking matters into our own hands. The thing is, God promises that he is with us in our waiting, even when it doesn't feel like he is. He promises that he is, and he asks that we trust him as we wait. So, we're going to read from 1 Samuel now. So, if you have your Bibles, um, you can turn to it. If not, the words will appear up there. So, it says this, starting from verse 1. We're going to read the whole chapter, so bear with me on this one. It says, After Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So, Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding farther back in that very cave. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. But then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. The Lord knows I shouldn't have done that to my lord the king, he said to his men. The Lord forbid that I should do this to my lord the king and attack the Lord's anointed one. For the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Then he shouted to Saul, Why do you listen to the people who say I am trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your own eyes, it isn't true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It is a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you for what you are trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. As that old proverb says, from evil people come evil deeds. So you can be sure I will never harm you. Who is the king of Israel trying to catch anyway? Should he spend his time chasing one who is as worthless as a dead dog or a single flea? 
May the Lord therefore judge which of us is right and punish the guilty one. He is my advocate and he will rescue me from your power. When David had finished speaking, Saul called back, Is that really you, my son David? And then he began to cry. And he said to David, You are a better man than I am, for you have repaid me good for evil. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today, for when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would let his enemy get away when he had him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. And now I realise that you are surely going to be king, and the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. Now swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family and destroy my line of descendants. So Saul promised this to Saul with an oath. Then Saul went home, and David and his men returned back to their stronghold. There is a lot of stuff in that passage that we could pull out and talk about today. But as I said, we're going to focus on what we can learn from David about waiting. And the first thing that I pulled out of this was that opportunity doesn't always mean action. And what I mean by that is that sometimes when we're waiting for things, or we feel that God has promised us something, so we're waiting for that promise to come to fruition. All these opportunities may present themselves, and it can seem like God is speaking to us and telling us to take that opportunity or take that opportunity, because they seem to lead to the thing that we're waiting for. But in this case, we see that David doesn't do that. So I just want us to get into the mindset of David right now. Imagine you're David. God has promised you the kingdom. He's promised that you are going to be the king. Yet the current king is trying to kill you and is hunting you. You've been on the run for years. We feel, think that from the time that David was, first went on the run to when he became king, he was on the run for about 15 years. That's a long time to wait. You're looking over your shoulder. You're not able to really settle, and you're exhausted. Has God really promised that you're going to have the kingdom? Where is God in all of this? So on this particular occasion, you and your men decide to hide in this cave, because you need a bit of respite. Now these caves, it says in verse 3, that at the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, that is where David and his men were hiding. And these sheepfolds would have been these huge caves where herds of sheep would have been sheltered from the weather. So David and his men could have quite easily gone into the back of this cave and been out of sight. So you think, surely, surely we'll be safe in this cave. But then, opportunity strikes. The king, the one who is trying to kill you, who is the reason that you're not currently king, enters that cave to relieve himself. He's distracted now. This must be a God-given opportunity. You could kill the king, not only save your life, but then you would be king, you would have the kingdom. It's too easy. It must be from God. He's right there. Another thing, that would have made it even easier for you to kill King Saul at this time, were that all of Saul's men were outside the cave. It says that Saul had 3,000 elite troops. They would have been outside in that area, probably taking a chance just to switch off slightly, have a bit of a rest while their king goes out of sight for a little bit of time. They're going to be making noise. They're not going to hear you if you do anything to Saul. And they certainly wouldn't enter the cave knowing that the king was in there having his business. They're not going to do that, are they? It's perfect. Surely this opportunity is from God. But we read that David didn't take that opportunity to kill Saul. God didn't make any promise to David of delivering Saul into his hands. He told him he'd have the kingdom, but he didn't tell him how. 
David wanted to be obedient to God. We heard a couple of weeks ago from Jasmine who was speaking about David's heart. And we know that God chose David because of his heart. David didn't want to sin to get what was promised to him. And we read that David knew Saul had been anointed by God. And he knew that he had to let God act when he was ready. He was not to take this opportunity. Opportunity doesn't always mean action. Now I have my own little personal story about this. And it was a time, probably about three, four years ago, when I was in a job and I was really unhappy. So I did the really responsible thing and I quit without having another job to go to, as you do. And I did manage to apply to a job, had an interview and was offered the job. But I really felt God was telling me to turn it down. And that was quite a hard decision because I knew it was a job I could do. I would probably enjoy it. It wouldn't be too stressful. And having just been in a job that was really stressful, it seemed like the ideal job. But I really felt God said no. So I turned it down. I thought, surely I won't have to wait that long. The job that God is going to give me will come up soon enough. And I really felt God was telling me just to wait. He would provide the right job. But months went by, and I was applying to jobs, and I was having some interviews, but I was never getting the job. And I was thinking, come on, God, you've told me to wait. How long have I got to wait? It was getting really hard. My identity was getting challenged. I was frustrated. I was doubting God's promise. I got bored. I was losing hope and I was putting my hope in the job rather than in God. And just to cut a long story short, nine months later, so I had this initial nine months of unemployment and driving everyone insane with how bored I was getting, little opportunities were being provided. And I started volunteering for a charity and at the same time I was able to do some casual work back in the probation service where I used to work. And that provided me the finances that I needed in quite a minimal stress job, which was ideal. Another nine months later, the place where I was volunteering offered me a job. They even let me check the job description to see if it's what I wanted to do. And that was the ideal job for me. And it's something that I'm still doing, that I still am really passionate about, and I really love. But that was 18 months. And I think when I read this passage about David, at least I didn't have to wait 15 years. I'm not sure I would have coped. But for me in that instant, actually the waiting, it was worthwhile. Because God provided me a job that I genuinely can say I enjoy. Yes, it has its frustrations, but I don't dread getting up in the morning. I really learned in that situation that just because you have an opportunity, it doesn't always mean that you should act on it. But what else can we learn from David in this situation? Now, this point is really obvious. Listening to God's voice is really important. And I know that sounds obvious, but we don't always do it. And when we're waiting for something, it's also really easy to listen to other people and to kind of think that what they're saying is what we should be doing rather than really listening to what God says. Now, just as a little caveat, I'm not saying that we should never listen to other people's advice because there's some people who are so godly and really wise and have really good advice about what we can do. But I would always just encourage us to go back to God and just double check with him. Now, in this passage, everything indicates that David should kill Saul and take his place on the throne of Israel. Yet David rejects this conventional wisdom And he uses a different method for deciding what is right. Verse 4 says this. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. David's men believed that God had given Saul over to David. David could have listened to his men. It made sense. This was a great opportunity. But instead, David creeps forward 
and he cuts off the hem of Saul's robe. Now the robe is an outer garment, often called a cloak, and it's likely that Saul would have taken this off because he wouldn't have wanted to get any mess on it because it was quite nice. So David had this chance just to creep forward and cut a bit off. But then his conscience began bothering him. And actually, sometimes it can, we're not always sure how God communicates with us. Sometimes we think, well, I don't know how to hear God's voice. But I feel that in this situation, God is communicating with David through his conscience. David think, was thinking, I don't think I should have done this. But God might also communicate with us in different ways. So sometimes we might hear words or we might have pictures or images, maybe little promptings. Or if you're like me, sometimes, especially when I'm being really obstinate and stubborn, I feel like God is elbowing me in the side and he's going, go on, Esther, go on, this is what I want you to do. But with David, it was his conscience. But David recognised God's voice in this situation. He knew that this was God talking to him. And he knew he wasn't to take matters into his own hands. In this situation, David listened to God's voice. He didn't want to sit on the throne because he got Saul out of the way. He wanted to sit on the throne because it was God's timing and God had sorted it. But interestingly enough, when you read further on, we read verse 9. And David says to Saul, why do you listen to the people who are saying I am trying to harm you? So Saul, we can infer from this, has been listening to men. And he believes that David is out to kill him. When actually, there's nothing in the previous chapters about David trying to kill Saul at all. And it's really interesting if you read further through Samuel that Saul starts to want to please men more than he wants to please God. And he listens to men more than he pleases God. And he, has, he no longer is king because of the actions that he takes through listening to men. It is clear that David is not out to kill Saul. Yet Saul has just listened to everyone else and has rounded up 3,000 troops to go and find him. But what we also then figure out as we read, or not as we figure out because it tells us, is that Saul recognises David's actions would make him a great king. Because David passed up the opportunity to take what he wanted. It meant that it showed his character was better than that of Saul's. David didn't always listen to God, though. And if you read on a little bit more through the book of Samuel, you will realise that David does make choices where he's listened to other people and not God. And it doesn't always end that well for himself or the people he is leading. So it's a really good example of actually, when we listen to God, generally things will work out better. But it must have been hard for David He's been waiting a long time. He might not feel that God is really with him in that time. But yet he still chooses to listen to God and trust in what God is doing and saying. But back to my little story. So whilst I wasn't working, in my time of being unemployed, I had quite a lot of people ask me what job I was applying to. Had I got a job yet? What was I doing with my time? Because surely if I wasn't working, I must have been really busy filling my time because that's what we do, right? When I explained that I felt God was telling me to wait, some people found that really hard to accept. And I kept hearing the, but no, surely you should be applying to something. But no, surely you must be doing something else. And I felt a real pressure to try and get a job. Even though there weren't jobs that I really wanted to do, I felt I should at least be applying to something so I could tell these people I was doing something constructive with my time. But because I'm pretty stubborn, work sometimes, it's not a bad trait to have, I did keep listening to God. It wasn't easy, but I used my time to wait on God 
and to learn to recognize his voice. So that when I had his promptings, when I had those elbows in my side telling me to do something, I knew that it was from God. And so listening to God's voice is really important. But David wasn't the only one who had to wait in life. Jesus was someone who had to wait. He had to wait 30 years before acting on opportunities he had to heal the sick, to love the poor, and to tell people who he was and why he had come. I imagine that throughout Jesus' ministry, he would have had people telling him not to do things. Jesus, don't hang out with that person. They're sick. You'll catch an illness. Don't hang out with that person. They're a thief. Jesus, what are you doing? Yet he recognized his father's voice and he knew what he was to do. And Jesus' life, death and resurrection made a way for us to have a right relationship with God. All we have to do is choose whose voice we will listen to. And today Jesus is asking, will you listen to me and trust me today? So what does this all mean for us? So hopefully up on the screen there's going to be a few little options. So it might be that we're just waiting for what God's best is and we need to be patient. But I know that's hard. Like waiting can be really hard and it can be really painful. It may be that we, we kind of look at this opportunity that we've got and we really just need to spend time listening to God and weighing up. Is this really from God? Is this going to cause me to sin if I act on this opportunity? Or is this going to mean I'm acting with the character of God? It might be that actually we go and ask someone else. We have a chat with someone about the opportunity or whatever's going on and just seek their wisdom. Because as I said, it's not necessarily a bad thing to ask other people. But just always reflect that back with God and see what he's saying. It may be that today we want to say yes to trusting God, as we heard little Joshua, Joseph, sorry, Joseph, who said he wants to be God's best, God's best friend. Maybe that's something that we need to do today. Or maybe we need to just make that tough choice. Do we act or do we wait? And as I close and just before I pray, there's, always, um, there's a couple of verses in the Bible that I always reflect on and have always kind of helped me from the very beginning of my life with Jesus, really. And that's Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 6. It says, Trust in the Lord your God and do not lean on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. So I'm just going to pray and then the band will come back up and lead us in a response. Yeah, Father, I thank you that, that you are always with us, even in our waiting. That Lord, even though at times it can really feel that you're not there, and I imagine David had times when he felt you weren't there, and we can read his responses to you in the Psalms. Lord, I thank you that actually the truth is you were there with him. Father, I thank you that, that you see what's going on. You see the bigger picture even when we can't see it. And Father, I pray that all of us would be able to keep trusting in you. Keep trusting that, that you were in this time of waiting with us. That Father, you know the best, what the best for us is. And Lord, I thank you that you love us that much that you ask us to wait because you don't want us to go down a path that isn't going to be good for us or helpful. So yeah, Holy Spirit, I just pray that that you would bless us in this time and just provide people around us as we wait as well who can be encouragers and who can pray for us and fight for us and cheer us on. In your precious name. Amen.